Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third in our five part panel discussion series addressing some of the fundamental issues and opportunities of Canada's EV charging infrastructure. I'm Nino DiCara, the founder of Electric Autonomy Canada, and I'm delighted to introduce this third episode in the series, Simplifying the EV Charging Experience, which is sponsored by ABB. We're grateful to ABB for their support of this discussion. Well, we're moving through the adoption growth curve as electric vehicles become more mainstream. And it's fair to say that using EV charging infrastructure still has some of the hallmarks of early stage technology and that it hasn't fully evolved yet, I would say, into being a seamless user experience. To set the scene for this discussion, I thought it would be helpful to share one of the letters we received from an EV driver, Graham Lodge, who shared his recent experience traveling from Kingston, Ontario to Charlottetown in PEI in his Nissan Leaf. And he explains the charging stations would not recognize the app on my iPhone. And I often could not get a remote start on the level three chargers. My, ca my card had not arrived by the time I departed. One good Samaritan, spent an hour trying to help to no avail. He then paid for my charge using his card. It's a, it's a little example and that there are many of them uh, of, of some of the, the challenges out there. So how do we move to a more simplified EV charging experience? Well, we've got a great panel to help us understand what we need to do and uh, how we can move forward. And I'm pleased to introduce you to them now. They are Don Romano, President and CEO, at Hyundai Canada, Monica Kerman, Program Manager, Customer Experience at BC Hydro, Stephen Beder, Regional Sales Manager, Ontario and Eastern Canada at Shell Recharge Solutions, Matthew Bartolone, National Sales Manager, Car and Fleet at ABB eMobility, and my colleague, Emma Jarrett, Managing Editor of Electric Autonomy Canada, who will be moderating the discussion today. So over to you, Emma. Thanks, Nino. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to have you all here. Um, I know I've been told that this is a very big World Cup day, so <laughs> thank you for making the time to uh, have the chat with us on simplifying EV charging. So I will pick up right where Nino left off. Um, Monica, as we've just heard, one of the number one complaints we hear all the time about charging um, at, at public or on public networks is the fragmented experience, everything from different ways to turn on the machine and plug in to different methods of paying to different ways of getting help if and when you need it. So how is BC Hydro tackling um, the concept of simplifying the EV charging experience on its own network? Okay, I've unmuted myself, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, this whole, you know, simplifying experience and, you know, you find that, you know, at the beginning, the early adopters were a lot more tolerant of, of mistakes and not an easy experience. But of course, as more and more people are adopting and driving EVs, we've got to make it a lot simpler. So in terms of uh, charging uh, station activation, um, to try to make that simpler, we're actually trying to offer more ways to pay and activate. 
because there isn't sort of a single way to pay at the moment. So we're trying to accommodate different ways to pay. So um, we have three BC Hydro EV activation options. So we have a BC Hydro app that allows you to activate and pay for uh, a charge. We have an RFID card, um, and we also have the ability to do kind of a one-time credit card charge. Um, but we also have roaming with other partners, so customers can use their existing flow or their charge point or their shell recharge account to uh, activate BC Hydro chargers because we know that people don't necessarily stay in, the, in one jurisdiction, they will travel, and so they've got to be able to come to a station, be able to activate it and, uh, and pay for a charge and not be stranded anywhere. Is there any, there's another part of that question that I didn't answer that you wanted me to answer? <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I was, I was going to follow up with, and in terms of, um, or the networks and simplifying the um, service of offering EV charging, um, how does uh, kilowatt hour billing fit into this? Is there um, a simplification there on the, the network side? So right now when people pay, of course they pay by time. Time, so it's time-based, uh, but we did clearly hear from all of our customers that they want energy-based kilowatt hour billing for their EV charging. And, and the analogy that's the most popular one is that when you go to a gas station, you don't, uh, you aren't charged by the, the number of minutes that you're at a gas, uh, ask at a gas station pump, you're charged for the, the liters of fuel that you put into your vehicle. And so they point to this and saying that that's the, you know, the fairest. Um, we so we are you know taking part and we're following the Measurement Canada dispensation process you know closely, um, but at the same time we're not really sure just yet what's the right rate model. Um, is it kilowatt hour you know kilowatt hour based charging or is it some combination? Um, because after a, a certain point, like let's say when you're you know first eighty percent or so at a fifty kilowatt charger. Um, it starts to trickle after that, depending on your vehicle and battery size and everything. So it doesn't seem to make sense to be sitting and paying sort of a premium at an expensive piece of equipment for a trickle charge. So how do we maybe in introduce the time in there so that you prevent people from, uh, you know, dwelling too long at a station and maybe moving to a level two if they needed to get to 100%. Thanks, Monica. So, Stephen, same kind of question to you. You know, I'd love to hear Shell's perspective on this. Obviously, different network, different approaches, um, but there is um, a common thread, which is streamlining the experience. So how's Shell going to tackle this? Well, Monica brought up a lot of key points there on why and how we operate as well and with, you know, different um, billing models. You know, you want to be focused on um, convenience and delivering that simplified, easy customer experience uh, as a whole. And so, you know, we have multiple methods of payment as well with um, RFID cards and the uh, mobile app, Shell Recharge Solutions mobile app. Um, and we also do have uh, at some of our stations uh, payment by credit card. And, you know, it's really all about um, providing turnkey solutions at Shell for, for fleets primarily, but we are growing our network. And right now, like our plan is to, to um, deploy over 500,000 charging points by 2025 and 2.5 million by 2030. So it's a massive endeavor. And, you know, we, we do, do really have a focus on the convenience as a top priority and keeping those chargers operable and interoperable uh, with other networks as well. So, we have many, many uh, roaming agreements with various vendors. So it's uh, it's a work in progress. And there's a lot, there's lots of chargers to be deployed here in Canada. And I think, um, you know, developing a billing model that will allow charging hosts to be profitable, uh, to generate an ROI and keep drivers happy. That's, that's a very challenging um, space to be in right now, but we're up for the challenge. Sorry, it might have been my internet connection. Did you say that credit card, um, like TAP, is only going to be available on some of the, the charging stations or all of them? Some of them have it right now and more will in the future. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, Matthew, obviously, you know, people can pay for things with the credit card in their hand or we could sort of reverse the the relationship there and put the system into the vehicles. So would you be able to walk us through plug and charge 
and, you know, how that could play into um, simplifying the EV charging ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Emma. And I'm reading through the chat, the Q&A here already. I already see that a couple of questions have come in specifically on plug and charge specifically on ISO 15118. So I'm going to walk through that question a little bit here. So first, let's talk what is plug and charge, the availability of it, and kind of the technology behind it. So what we've been talking about here is, is authenticating charging sessions. So that's done via fobs, via credit card readers, via applications. So the concept of plug and charge is to take that first stage, the authenticating between the person and the machine, and it, it adds it to the action of actually plugging the connector into your vehicle. So there's certificates on both vehicle and charger side, a handshake that's made, and then an, an, an identification to know who to charge for that charging session. That's the concept of plug, plug and charge. So a seamless charging experience removes the use of apps, credit card readers, et cetera. How that's done. So in order for the communication to happen properly, that's where you need a set of rules or a protocol to follow. So that's what ISO 15118 created, a standardized protocol across chargers and vehicles for the industry as a whole. And the third part to that, so the technology, is this available today? Which I saw was one of the questions in the chat. So the answer to that is, is yes, but, right? So there's, there's use cases where we do see plug and charge already in action today for certain OEMs, for certain charging networks. Now what's gonna happen is that to ramp up all vehicle OEMs, all charging OEMs, and, and let's call it all networks, in some cases, hardware upgrades will be required. In some cases, it will just be software. So if I'm speaking just for ABB, typically it's just a software upgrade that's required. And then on the final side, if you're looking at kind of the used cases for it, the different networks that'll be using this, it really is, we need to look at these as individual case studies. And we need to roll these out as individual case studies. It, I can't see this being a mass deployment. It needs to be tried, tested, and then deployed to the consumer. Again, the purpose of, so the purpose of this, this panel today is simplify the charging experience. While this is a good mechanism to do it, we need to make sure that we don't confuse and complicate things for the consumer either. If ever a technology that's supposed to work a certain way doesn't in certain applications. Yeah. Thank you. So Don, that puts you in the hot seat because uh, the Ionic 5 is one of the vehicles on the market that does support plug and charge technology. So, you know, I'd love to pick, for you to pick up right where Matthew left off and, you know, how, how are you going to guarantee that this works on the vehicle, that customers aren't left stranded if it conks out? Um, and generally speaking, what actions would you like to see the market um, take to make plug and charge a mainstream uh, solution? Yeah, I don't right now. I think we're missing the point. And the point is we only have 1,500 level three charging outlets and we have 12,000 gas stations currently supporting our, our network. I mean, we're, we're talking about the technology to use 1,500 different outlets. So we need to what Stephen's doing, uh, what Shell's working on, we need to put more outlets out there, number one. I mean, you have to work in, in the business to really understand what customers are looking for. I'm sure there's a lot of early adopters that are listening right now, and, and they're looking at all the standards, and they're used to the Tesla system of, of charging and, and billing, but that's not mainstream. Mainstream is going to come out and say, listen, <laughs> I had this Ford pickup truck. I had this Toyota. I had this Hyundai. I want to get into electric, but I, I can't charge at home. What do I do? And at that point, you better have a simple answer to get them started. And that is one, you can go to your nearby Shell station. You can swipe your credit card and you can have a charge for uh, anywhere between seven and ten, ten dollars And uh, you're going to save this much on your, your gas bill and you're going to make the environment better. That's where we're at right now. Um, that's where the market's at. Maybe not all the people on this call, but, you know, and then what we have to do is evolve that. And then at that point, uh, you know, right now we have a, a vehicle that has the ability through the connected system to have charging. But I'm with Matthew on that. We still have to test it. We have to secure it. We have to ensure that it's safe and that it works. In the meantime, out of the 1,500 chargers we have, do you know how many aren't working out there? And I think if you listen to Nino and some of the experiences people have, you know, they're told that a charger is uh, 
is available and they go there. It's not available. Or as Monica said, someone's parked in it. They've been there for three hours. So I think there's some fundamental issues that are, are actually more important at this stage to be get for us to get full adoption of electric vehicles. That's not to say this isn't important. I think charging, uh, I read, I think it was uh, Dave McDougall's first comment. It needs to be simple. And I'm, I'm, I think we all agree. And absolutely, we have to make it simple. But first, we have to make it accessible. And, and before simplicity comes in, let's let's make sure access is top priority. So then, you know, do you have do you have ideas about how you would like to see that rolled out? How Hyundai, you know, is is pushing for action one way or another? Yeah, I mean, I think it's reasonable to. If, you're, if the government is going to expect us to build them, which they do, and we have no problem with that, and we're talking electric vehicles, BEVs, not hybrids or plug-ins, uh, which I believe are transitory, but if you're getting into where we ultimately need to be, and that is pure electric vehicles, uh, we have ambitious goals set with the government to achieve 100%, and I think that, to me, to get there, it's not going to be a matter of how much lithium's out there, who's going to produce the batteries where. It's it's really going to be demand. We have to get people to feel comfortable with the transition from uh, ICE vehicles to EVs. And to do that, speaking for someone who's been on the showroom floors, listen to the customers day in and day out, they want to know that um, it can be easily charged anywhere. And you have over 5 million uh, there's 5 million Canadians that do not have garages. So, I mean, we have to we have to overcome that. And thank goodness for what Stephen's talking about when it comes down to uh, being able to go to a gas station and get a charge. So I think, but if the government's going to require us to build them, the government should also be requiring, uh, you know, every uh, new construction to have an infrastructure where you can put a charging system. So all condos, all uh, new homes, uh, all parking structures should be required to have them. Uh, all uh, strip centers and, and malls should be required to have them. And then we need to make sure we have laws that enforce that they are being used by EVs and not being used by people that found the EV locations more convenient to park. In Ontario, if you do that, there is a law, but it charges you $150. If you go to a handicapped spot, it's $300. And uh, I not sure that makes a lot of sense. I think 300 for either would be sufficient. But I think we're just gonna have to collaborate more. We've been doing it on the vehicle side. Now we're gonna have to do it more with the government on the charging side. It's gonna take, you know, and I know this gets overused, but it takes a village. Everybody's gonna have to come to the party. It's not gonna be just the OEMs build it, field of dreams and they will come. It's everybody coming together in this society to transition everybody from combustion engines to EVs and making sure that everybody plays a role in it. And uh, if you have a parking area, you should be thinking, how can I uh, make it electrified? How can I make it convenient for customers to use? And I think if we all do that, uh, then the ambitious goals that we've set will be achieved. Thanks, Don. So Stephen, just Picking up on what Don said about, um, you know, we all need to work together on this and um, also getting more information from you on what you were pointing to earlier about roaming agreements. Um, you know, what is Shell's position on this? Um, you know, simply do they help drivers? Is that, you know, Shell's experience? And do you and Shell think this is, you know, really the the path forward to get that very collaborative ecosystem that, that Don was talking about? Definitely. Yes. Having, you know, multiple um, roaming agreements with various brands like we do is, is essential because nobody wants to be fumbling around with with multiple apps on their phone and all, all kinds of RFID cards, even though it, it can be very helpful to have options. Um, I know I can tell you my last experience when I was going to Ottawa with my EV6, um, my credit card had not arrived in time. It expired October 30th. And uh, this was a November trip. So fortunately, I had my RFID cards with me that had some funds loaded on my shell card and a couple other ones. So I had backup options. So, you know, having roaming agreements, you can use different different networks with different cards, different payment options is a good thing. Choice is good, but we want to make sure it's convenient. And 
placing chargers at locations are often a challenge because what we're doing today is we're generally retrofitting existing buildings with charging infrastructure. And so quite often those chargers get placed in locations that are not prime time. They're, they're Sometimes they are. Sometimes it's a bonus because the electrical room is really close to the front of the building and you can have like a great location that is visible. And other times that charging is placed somewhere off the beaten path a bit. And it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to run conduit long distances at, at high cost. So this is where we, we have to plan for plan for sites that are maybe design build, like, like the um, last year's electric autonomy design competition was featuring beautiful, fully designed charging facilities, um, rest stops and such that were from the ground up purpose built for EV charging. And so that makes it, you know, make more sense for the, the driver. They can see easily where the chargers are placed and, and yeah, it's again about, about convenience. It's about simplifying the experience and making it reliable. Thanks. And Monica, I want to grab your answer to um, an audience question on this on this topic. I'm just going to hook it out of here. It's very timely. Um, from BC Hydro's position, what are the pros and cons of peer-to-peer -peer roaming agreements versus roaming through a central hub? That I'm not equipped to answer. <laughs> I, I don't have I, I don't have that much background on that particular piece. I'm more on user experience experience and driver experience and what we've done to try to improve that and and uh, plug into that. But um, maybe one of my colleagues who's watching will send me a, um, a message. And, and if I get it, I will let you know. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Anybody else want to take that one? Um, I guess that sort of sounds like um, the Passport Travel Plan through Charge Hub. Um, so they have a roaming agreement that uh, Shell is part of and uh, that allows multiple uh, networks to be a part of and use just the Charge Hub app uh, or the uh, travel passport travel plan app to to activate a session. So um, yeah, that makes this interoperability very convenient again, and and less apps and less less RFID cards and and uh, a simplified experience. Great, thanks. So Monica, I'll, I'll loop back to you and focusing on the the customer experience. Um, you know, does BC Hydro uh, conduct customer research um, regularly to take the pulse, we'll say, of what what EV drivers are looking for? And if so, um, yeah. what data revealing? Okay, so yes, yes, we do. Uh, we do quite uh, extensive customer research. We use design thinking uh, principles in terms of really getting out into the field and putting ourselves in the in the shoes of drivers across the province. Um, and uh, we do uh, regular surveys, not just on public charging, but on residential charging. Um, it, when I, if I speak to uh, public charging, um, we uh, the three main areas where drivers were insistent that we needed to do a better job and which we've been working on is of course the reliability of the charging network there's nothing more frustrating than making plans and, and arriving at a station and the station is not working and it's not like the gas stations where you know if, what if if miraculously with the gas stations down there's another gas station down the block you, you're you, you're always going to have a good backup uh, so reliability is super important and we've been working very hard to improve reliability there. The other piece is expanding the charging network. So more sites across the province and more chargers per site. That was a big, uh, a big ask and a big demand uh, of us. So we are obligated jointly with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure to ensure geographic, uh, provincial geographic coverage by uh, fall 2024. So we also have a government mandate to make sure that uh, that there are chargers that cover the province, even if it might be in communities or areas or, or rest stops with, that don't get a lot of use, but it's required to support provincial travel. Um, and then there is a big piece around improving driver experience and safety. So big insights there was, you know, this thought that especially, you know, at um, the 50 kilowatt hour or the 25 kilowatt hour charging where it takes a little bit of time. Uh, charging time is considered wasted time, so they want something to do. Uh, so proximity to amenities is important, a bathroom break, do some errands, go shopping, uh, do some banking, um, that sort of thing. Like if you're gonna do it, you know, strip malls, uh, parking lots, that kind of thing is, is an ideal place where there's something to do while you wait 
for, you know, wait to charge or wait while you're charging. The other piece is safety by design. In the beginning, there was uh, charging stations where you would not send your loved one there at night. Uh, so why would we send our customers there at night? They were, you know, in alleyways and underground parking lots, very dimly lit. So the idea that it should be, uh, you know, uh, safe, open to vehicular and passenger traffic, well lit, security and that sort of thing. Uh, big piece on etiquette and behavior. So for the for the longtime EV drivers, they they had an understanding about how long you should stay at a that you should sign into flex share and you should let the net, you know person know, hey, I'm only here for 30 minutes, but text me if you need it and I'll come out and unplug so you can plug. Or hey, don't worry, unplug me. Uh, was newer drivers weren't uh, sort of aware of of the etiquette and and uh, and things you should do like you know kindly put the cord back on the on the machine uh, don't leave you know don't like park here this you know and don't if you have an ice vehicle please don't use this spot so we found that we needed to integrate sort of etiquette roles into sort of our signage and uh, online and the last piece was accessibility we realized that we had not building our uh, stations to accommodate drivers in wheelchairs, drivers with mobility issues, whether they were temporary or permanent. So wanting to build our stations to accommodate that, um, you know, working with uh, manufacturers to ensure that the uh, screens and the, the cords are much easier to reach for people if they are in, in wheelchairs. We did uh, get a an article out of the UK that said 60% of drivers who um, have mobility issues would switch to electric vehicles, but we're worried about the ability to charge how easy or hard it would be for them. So that's that's what uh, we've been uh, discovering. And um, those are the sort of the main customer insights that uh, that customers uh, have come to us and drivers have told us you need to do this. So that's how we were trying to build and uh, build our stations and select our sites. And uh, there are, we do have those guidelines published on our site as well. Monica and I can see Dawn nodding furiously in the background. So <laughs> is, uh, is what Monica is saying, addressing some of the concerns that customers are bringing you, Don? Yeah, absolutely. Dead on. Uh, you know, when we talk about safety um, and we talk about what Stephen was talking about, some of the locations that these chargers are, are at. It, it, yeah, yeah. And, and I think about um, accessibility, the luck making things lighter, better, we need to continue to evolve. Uh, some of these chargers are pretty heavy and not easy to move. So I, I think these are, now we're talking about mass adoption and bringing everybody into the EV world. And uh, yeah, no, I think, I think Monica nailed it. So Matthew, the, the cords and the chargers and the plugs, um, there's a bit of confusion there, especially with new drivers. They show up at a DC fast charge station and there are two different types of plugs there. Um, it is an added layer of complication. Do you think that the next natural step in charging simplification is having that one standard type of plug? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great point. So I think there's always there's always going to be at least a need for, for two, at least with the technology that we're seeing today. So one being the level two charging and two being the level three DC fast charging, just based on the number of pins and, and everything involved in the connector. If we focus on level three charging, so on the market today, as people drive drive through their cities and find chargers, they'll, they'll notice that there's there could be two types of connectors, the Shadamo and the CCS connector. What's Again, the way to orient that in your, in your mind is the Shadamo, older technology, CCS, newer technology. Um, so, so with that in mind, I think the, 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 the overarching thought here needs to be that chargers are selected based on technology and consumer experience. So what does a connector and cable allow us to do? It allows us to deploy amps into the vehicle. And the higher the number of amps, the higher number of kilowatts, the higher the number of the kilowatts, the less amount of time someone's waiting at a public charger so they can, they can go on with their day. So I think what, what's dictated what we we're going with in the market today, being the CCS1 technology, is the fact that it can ramp up to 500 amps right now. So it, when we see the CCS, which will typically be a black connector on the market today, the reason that it's one out is because it's the superior technology. Going forward, I, I there's obviously the counter argument there saying, well, what if tomorrow newer, better technology comes out? And I think we can't, we can't be 
we're not in a position as an industry to say, no, we can't look at that. We need to be entertaining better and newer technology as it comes out in the years to come. As that happens, I think we need to deploy that to the market in a very controlled way though. And there's organizations that are now in place to standardize, to, to, to bring together charging standards. The reason those are important is to avoid confusion with the consumers, because just when people will start to feel like they're wrapping their head around which type of connector they're used to on a day to day, and all of a sudden there's something different in front of them. If that hasn't been deployed to the market with very clear messaging, we're going to create a very confusing consumer experience. So the balance of technology and proper deployment for a good consumer experience, I think, is crucial when it comes to both connectors and cables that are being used for EV chargers. Thanks. And um, I had a news question about if you thought Tesla was going to, when their North American charging standard is going to influence the issue at all. But um, there's a really interesting audience question about um, a different regulation standard sure. that I would also love to get your thoughts on. And they have asked, um, is there a standard or regulation as to how often the chargers and plugs need to be tested? That's that's a Great question. So I, we as as ABB, we won't we won't have standards to say like it things need to be tested every six months. So I think something like that might be available at a federal level or a provincial level. In terms of as as an OEM, what we'll, what we'll require for our chargers is there's visual inspections in order to have any type of let's say extended warranty. Maintenance plans are crucial. So that includes preventive maintenance plans, which include visual inspections. So in that case, you'd be trying everything related to the charger, specifically the connector. And the other thing to remember is that there's maintenance after a certain amount of time, but there's also maintenance that's required after a certain number of, of matings, let's say. It's like cycle-based, so it's usage-based maintenance. Mm -hmm. So if a connector is used X number of times, it will require a replacement. And the whole point of that is, is to ensure that customers aren't using beat up, beat up connectors that have damaged components, right? we need to ensure that there's a certain level of consistency across the market. Yeah. Great. And, and Stephen and Monica, I don't know if you want to respond to that. If, if your respective networks have um, their own internal policies about inspecting um, chargers. Um, well, I can tell you that we have different service level agreements with some of our, our clients that um, purchase through us hardware. One of our vendors is of course, ABB that we work with on hardware. Um, but the end, end user or end purchaser that uh, we work with installing the, the complete turnkey solutions for, um, you know, they can choose different levels, like whether it's uh, 97, 98% uptime and, and so on. So it's an uptime number that is what most networks are after. And I know, I believe some of the RFPs from the federal government uh, might also address uh, minimum uptime uh, in their specifications too. So, so that's... That's uh, not necessarily a, a regulation, but a way of ensuring better uptime and, and reliability. Okay. Don, uh, I mean, it's funny, not funny, the way uh, Monica phrased it, like there are chargers that you wouldn't send your loved one to because they're very, very sketchy and like location wise. Um, <laughs> but it it it's not funny because it actually is a big issue with with adoption, um, chargers can be really hard to find. I know for me, you know, just personal disclosure, I drove to Muskoka this summer and I actually wanted to count how many of the EV charge signs I would spot the same way you'd look for gas, you know, locations. And I saw one, the entire like three and a half hour drive up the highway. So, um, you know, how is Hyundai addressing this barrier for people who are looking for EV chargers, don't know where to find them? And is there anything um, OEMs need from charging networks or technology providers to create um, better visibility, both on just where chargers are located, but also if they're operable? Yeah, no, it's a good question, but I don't think it's a Hyundai question. It's an industry question. I mean, Hyundai alone isn't gonna change the, the industry, I think. Um, we have to look at every manufacturer of ICE vehicles and we have to look at their plans to, to move into uh, electrification and get their EVs out in the marketplace, affordable EVs, not just the high end. We, we've got to be able to make vehicles in every segment for everybody. And that's, that's a task uh, right now with the, the expense structure and inflation and everything else. But, 
you know, to, to do that, we're going to have to come up with industry solutions. And right now, I think given the competitive nature, there's, there's different models out in our industry. Tesla uses one model. The franchise system is another model. There's other companies that are coming in. Uh, some of them do not even have facilities to get the vehicles repaired. They tell you they'll repair it in their driveway. There's, there's a lot of chaos going on out there. And we need the chaos to settle down. And then we as an industry need to come together to be able to help all customers transitioning from ICE vehicles to EV vehicles. And while we all currently have our individual ways of doing that, I don't think an individual way is the ultimate solution uh, to get the, the level of adoption and the speed at which we need the adoption to take place. So we have a lot of work to do. And what we're doing now is we, we work closely with a group called the GAC, and it's the Global Automobile Companies. Uh, they're all imports. And we try to get uh, alignment on how we should be communicating with customers. And, you know, we don't all use the same chargers. You know, we were just talking about the CCS and Chatamo. And, you know, there, there's still a lot of I guess you'd say non-standards out there in individual applications. And uh, that's just not going to work in the future. So we all have to come together and we got to figure out what's best for the customers. We got to talk to people like Matthew to figure out what's the best charging system, the fastest, the easiest, the most safe. And uh, and then we've got to work together on getting the and with the government very much so getting the standards in place. So I think what you're experiencing, a lot of people are experiencing or they're worried about experiencing and therefore, you know, they're okay. I think I'll still stick with uh, a combustion engine for now until I feel more secure and uh, I can take my uh, my EV from Kingston to, you know, Ottawa or I forget where the location was that the customer that Nino was talking about was driving. But I mean, we need to really think, okay, how are you going to, uh, one of your your questions came from a customer. How are we going to work with the U.S.? Because we have a lot of snowbirds and a lot of people that drive down there. And, you know, so are you going to have an EV and then you're going to have your big SUV next door and you're going to take that on the long trips and only use your EV for commuting? And, and that's not the vision of what we're trying to accomplish. So we also have to work with the U.S. and make sure that, you know, you're you're going up to Muskoka, but if you're heading down to New York or heading down to Pennsylvania or even down to Florida, that you're equally as confident that you can plug in. And uh, I think, as Monica said, you, know, you can go to, uh, you know, a convenience store. Uh, you know, I see this as a great opportunity to stop texting and distracted driving because now you got you know, 20 minutes to a half hour of your own time to get on your phone while you're parked and it's charging. And so, you know, there's, uh, or you can get, get, you know, your bottled water or your, your Snickers bar and your, your lotto ticket, or as uh, Steven's talking about, um, you know, you can have a lot of other amenities available to you. And I think businesses will begin to spring up around these, these areas that we, we put in. On route is a, a great example, I think, here in Ontario, where they're putting in chargers now. And, you know, they're, you can go in there and sit, eat, drink, chat, talk, whatever. They have Wi-Fi, use the washrooms, the facilities. And they're nice facilities, you know. But unfortunately, when you cross the border, <laughs> the facilities aren't so nice and there are no chargers out there. So, you know, we're going to have to we're gonna have to work with our friends down south to make sure that 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 connection uh, is all the way down to the southern border of the U.S. Yeah, and that's such a great point. And, you know, we're so closely connected. There is that over that north-south overlap. It, it has to be integrated, um, which brings me to a really lovely audience question. <laughs> um, I just, I really appreciate the simplicity of this. <laughs> Can EV drivers get a simple system not unlike the gas station model? And Stephen, I feel like you're the best position to to answer that for us. Um, is this can we replicate the gas station model rather than reinventing the wheel? Well, uh, of course, we do have charging stations at at some Shell gas stations and many more to come. So you know, replicating that experience so that you have convenience and and amenities at the place to charge, you know, is is in our interest. Um, Again, our focus primarily right this time is is on fleet charging in Canada, um, but I think 
you know, making it um, so that many charging stations, not like redundancy and and having convenient locations, lots of chargers at each each site is is really an important part of this. Um, not just having one or two, and when you have them at a convenient location like a gas station, uh, you know, I think it creates awareness as well. There's there's multiple benefits to that um, visibility and and uh, people understanding that. You know, you can conveniently charge. I, I think many years ago in Japan, um, they've, there's a commonly cited story about the number of charging stations that that uh, were deployed in the early days, and um, how that actually fueled huge growth in EV charging and the purchase of EVs in Japan because people just physically saw chargers. So, um, you know, not that they necessarily used them, but they were there and they created. Uh, a certain degree of comfort and confidence in an EV driver that there were some options for them in the case of an emergency and so on. Um, so I think that, um, you know, we really do have to have uh, the other amenities. You know, one of the things I'm excited uh, to see more of, uh, you know, at a, at a charging station is, uh, you know, things to, to do while you're charging your car, like vacuuming your car. Uh, and interestingly, one of the uh, new shell sites that I've seen in Europe, they actually did that. I'm really happy to hear that because I've been advocating for that for years. So, um, you know, while you're charging up, do something productive. And so, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. No, definitely. And, and Monica, I'd be really curious to bring in the um, consumer psychology component of this. And is that replication of the gas station? Um, system that we're all so used to, something that people are interested in? I I think that, you know, if, if you know, the, the nice thing about the, the you know, gas station is, you know, when you were first learning how to drive, your your mom or your dad had to maybe show you one time how to, how to fill the, you know, fill your tank and stuff. So, you know, it should be as easy as that. Um, the other thing about the gas station analogy that's interesting is this pull through pull through design um, because we looked at different you know designs where we have curbside charging and that is okay but it's not uh, it's not good for people with accessibility or mobility issues it's very difficult uh, for them to charge their cars in this uh, in this scenario and then you have the pull in you just kind of like and those are those are fine you can make those a little bit more accessible and and things like that but if you think about you know so we're doing more in especially in the sort of the more rural locations where we're and uh, road stops and things this pull through design because because people are driving larger vehicles, they, you know, pulling trailers and things like that. So if you're looking at sort of like, if we're all the current vehicles that people drive today, and if you electrify those, the pull through design that the gas station provides is much easier because you can maneuver your vehicle any which way to accommodate the side of the charge port. And the other thing that's quite helpful is, is those, uh, when we talk about cord management, um, is that those uh, gas stations where the cord sits on an arm, it's a lot easier to maneuver. And, and for people with accessibility issues, they were asking for that because um, especially when, you know, for the more powerful stations, those cords are gonna get heavy uh, because they need to be cooled with water. So that's even more difficult for people uh, with the lower upper body strength and you consider sort of the wide range of drivers, having that arm, that analogy there of, uh, of easier cord management is, is a benefit. So I think there's lots of things that we can do in terms of what people are you know, used to and like, um, and then add on those, those other items like you know, proximity to amenities, you know, be able to go for a little, you know, a quick walk, do something. Um, so, you know, electric vehicle charging is not the same as filling your uh, tank, um, but there are many, many things that we can take away and apply because it's a good analogy. Thanks. And I don't think I made it clear earlier, but we have moved on to the audience question portion of this. So sorry about that. Um, it was very seamless. We have a very active audience. So um, thank you everyone for your questions. Um, just a quick follow up for you, Monica. Um, while we're on the subject of uh, charger, like chargers um, that BC Hydro is deploying, um, are, are, is BC Hydro considering utilizing utility poles? And is that something that customers have indicated they wanted to be able to access level two charging? 
I think, yeah, we're looking at all of that, uh, you know, like that sort of that lamppost charging uh, and attaching them to utility poles. And we'll have to get there. And, you know, it's not just going to be cars, but it'll be like e-bikes and scooters and, and all the rest of it to accommodate, to, to accommodate all those different charging, uh, you know, whatever anybody needs to charge to have that uh, in place, that infrastructure in place. Thanks. And there was one other. There was one other comment somebody said to accommodate uh, uh, drivers with accessibility needs is this wireless charging. And I'd love that for everybody. I mean, that would be just the coolest thing. Pull into a spot, and the wireless charges you, and you're gone. <laughs> you don't even have to get out of your car. That would be very cool. I'm a fan of wireless charging. I'm excited to see where that will go. Um, Matt, maybe Matthew can enlighten us. <laughs> but before we talk about wireless charging, Matthew, um, is there? From the audience, is there any solution for plug and charge on L2 chargers supporting the SAE J1772 protocol? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I had seen that one come up too. So the, the J1772 is just the, the top circle on the CCS connector. It as long as it, it follows, as long as it's compliant with the ISO 1511 protocols, I wouldn't see why not. Um, but I beyond that, I don't I don't have that info in front of me. If I pull it up before we jump off the call. Um, internally, I'll be able to share. If not, I think we can always follow up with that question. Thanks so much. Um, so to the group, and Don, perhaps you can kick us off, and then everyone else can chime in. Someone wants to know, are we overcomplicating the problem with everyone very tunnel vision on DC fast charging? How many drivers are exceeding 400 kilometers a day? Yeah, well, you could actually ask, you know, 80% of the charging is done at home. Mm -hmm. So right now, I mean, most people, myself included, we, we charge at home, but we're privileged to have a garage and a, a charging system to do that. Um, I kind of like where Monica's going, and that is, you know, we've got to look at everybody, uh, everybody that buys a car. And, uh, you know, those people that have, uh, you know, they older people, younger people, inexperienced drivers, um, you got to look at society as a whole. If we're going to make a difference, you know, if we're really going to change uh, our reliance on fossil fuels to drive our cars and and move into this new electrical uh, age, we, we've got to we've got to think of everybody. And I think um, so. Yeah, it, it is complicated when you start putting all these different pieces together, but it won't slow us down. Uh, I think the only thing that will slow us down from full widespread adoption of EVs is if we do not build enough chargers uh, fast enough. Uh, the sooner we get those deployed, um, I, I just, I deal with customers. They, they come in, they, they want an EV. And the first question, it used to be, well, how far does it go? How long does it take to charge? And it's interesting to watch those issues diminish as they've become educated on the internet and they have friends that have EVs. And so now they're, they're like, no, I, this could fit my lifestyle, but where do I get it charged if I'm out on the road? If I'm driving from Kingston to, uh, to Toronto or Ottawa to Toronto. So I think that, you know, to keep it simple, we just need more. Mm -hmm. And then once we have more, we're going to dive into the issues of, okay, uh, how do we find them? How do we ensure they're operational? How can we make them lighter and easier? But nothing comes into a perfect package when, when you implement it. You know, everything evolves over time. And I think as long as we continue, as long as, as Stephen, you can hear where Shell's going. I'd love to see uh, his competitors have the same passion he has and, and move in the same direction, of which some are. So I don't, I don't want to discount uh, them as well. But you know, and I, I don't want to discount my competitors, but I, I want to kick them in the rear as well and say, come on, let's get more vehicles out there. I want the competition. I want customers to have more choices. I want to see a wider spread of price points out there uh, to fit everybody's needs. But if we if we just build more, you're going to be surprised how fast this is going to go, because that is the number one question is, well, I know it works if I'm going to Toronto. I, I know where to go around my area. But what if, you know, I like to go visit my friends. I like to drive to Muskoka. That's what they say. I like to drive with Emma to Muskoka. Where do I go? And I'm like, uh, here's, here's one app. Here's another app. You can check it out. Might work, might not work. You know, let's just get more of them out there so they have more choices. And I think we're all aligned on one thing. And this is the future. So 
it's uh, infrastructure time now. We've, we've got the cars coming. I think there's another 125 new models are gonna be introduced over the next 24 months. It's gonna be wild, uh, but I don't know if we're gonna see the same growth in the charging infrastructure and I hope we do. Anyone else wanna build off Don's points? I can, I might have something to say here, just I'm bringing it back to the question that you had said too, but also, so Don, the takeaway that I'm grabbing from there is we, we definitely need more. Right with with what's coming in the market today, and Emma, Emma, your point about is this overkill on the DCFC side of the conversation? So there's a very real split. To Don's point, is it 80, 20, 90, 10, where the majority of charging might be happening at home? Um, but there's always there's these sub sub pockets right of the population. So people that don't have access to a charger at home, how are we going to address that segment of the market today? How do we make either level two charging overnight available for them? Yeah. So I know that these are existing challenges that we're trying to we're trying to make sure that no one gets left behind, even though it's very difficult to bring everyone along with us as we try to get kick, quick wins too in these aggressive targets that we have with the government. So there's like a hybrid approach here, but I think the uh, we need more, but we also need to, to allocate. Is it more level three? Is it more level two for specific sub segments that just don't have access to to uh, to to affordable? Um, electricity for their vehicles. I think that's something that we need to get ahead of too as a group. I can just jump in on that as well and just say that, you know, it depends on your scope, I guess. You know, if you're thinking just light duty vehicles and maybe earlier generation uh, mm -hmm. vehicles with small battery packs, yeah, probably like a lot of L2s are, are fine. But when we start talking about medium and heavy duty and pickup trucks and, and electric refuse trucks, I'm working on some fleet projects with electric refuse, um, we're talking massive batteries and those need some seriously fast charging, you know, 500 amps, megawatt charging. This is, you know, needed to get the bigger stuff on the road electrified. So, yeah, it, 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 you need a Swiss Army approach to this to have lots of different um, charging levels. Even level one is good for many fleets, you know, charging um, small battery packs that don't have very long uh, routes can be done on level one in some cases, but um, this, there's not a one size fits all when it comes to charging. Anything to add, Monica? Yeah, they, I'd like to follow up on, uh, on Stephen's comment when, uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And if you look at what the customer journey is and, you know, what the or the, what the driver requires. So if the, if the driver is going to go to a mall and spend four hours there, level two charging is perfect. Um, if a driver, you know, has got is going to go to a, you know, grocery store or do some errands, you know, maybe, maybe you know, 30 to 40 minutes at a charger is perfect. So, uh, you know, a DC, at C, the, you know, level three is good. But, you know, when you think about um, wanting to do like a longer road trip, sort of at road stops, maybe it's a super fast charger there that should be, you know, the charging time should be the equivalent of stretching your legs in a bathroom break. So it's really just kind of matching the, the charging levels and, uh, and speed to what the driver is requiring. Yeah, you know, actually sometimes your charging can be too fast. I've had to pay idling fees at a Canadian Tire once. <laughs> Didn't like that too much because I was at a 350 kilowatt charger. My car will charge at 240 kilowatt. Um, like the Ionic 5 does, uh, super fast 800 volt architecture, and I had to. I was there too long, or was there? I was there inside shopping too long, and I came out and I had to pay like 10 bucks in our idling fee. So <laughs> it wasn't on our network, fortunately, but uh, it does happen. Not too much of a good thing, I guess. <laughs> There, there was one comment, Emma, about uh, about signage uh, from uh, somebody from the Mid-Island, mid I think it's uh, BC Association, about uh, wayfinding size signage. And so what BC Hydro is doing, so we work with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure for highway signage to point people to where um, uh, fast charging is available. And on site, we have a beacon. It's a lit beacon that's on an 18-foot arm, light arm. Um, to uh, signal to drivers so they don't have to look around the parking lot or, you know, can see it across the street, can see it as they drive into the lot where the charger is. So that's what we're trying to do to, to uh, help with the with the wayfinding. Thanks, Monica. I really appreciate you grabbing that question. Um, that's very um, an interesting strategy. I don't I don't think I've seen that in Ontario, at least where I am. So that could be a neat one to replicate. Um, we are out of time, but thank you so much to everybody uh, in the audience for your fantastic questions and engagement. It's so appreciated. And to our panelists, thank you for joining us today. 
there is three minutes to get to the World Cup. So <laughs> enjoy, enjoy watching. And I will hand it back to Nina to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, th thank, well, thank you, Emma, for moderating. And uh, I'll add my thanks to the panel as well, to uh, Don, Monica, Stephen and Matthew for just really stepping up and sharing uh, their, their great insights about what is a really, you know, clearly it's, it's a very difficult nut for us to crack, but I think a lot more collaboration is, is going to get us there. Um, and thanks to everybody in the audience for uh, your questions. That There were far, far more than we could get to, but uh, we managed to get through a good, good number. So thanks to Emma and the panel for that. Uh, a big thanks once again to our sponsors, uh, ABB, for sponsoring today's panel discussion. And uh, tomorrow we have our fourth panel in which we'll discuss how we democratize uh, EV charging. So please visit our website and make sure that you are individually uh, registered for, for that event. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us and uh, go Canada in the, in the football with soccer today.